we started with large networks where the only thing that we were worried about was the accuracy of the model, regardless of the cost. Then we went and studied small networks where not only we worried about high accuracy, we also wanted to have fast algorithms and memory efficient algorithms. And then we tried to make the process automatic using AutoML, trying to come up with different architectures and let the computer do it as much as possible. But in the end of the day, you're gonna end up with a code that you're gonna put in production, maybe on a self-driving car, maybe on a drone, maybe somewhere on the internet, on somebody's homepage to do some cool things with images or text or speech. Then we said, okay, we want to put it in production, but you cannot put anything in production. You have to make sure that it is secure. There are no uh, security gaps. And that's why we studied robustness. We want to put neural networks into production that are robust. Now you put your algorithm in production and then suddenly something is not right. You start noticing some anomalies. You start noticing some bugs. Now it's time to go back and try to debug and try to understand what went wrong. Can you actually fix it? But here is my question for you. If you want to fix an algorithm that is coming out of deep neural networks, where is the bug going to be? What is the source code? So I need to hear an answer. I want you to brainstorm. So the question is, what is the source code for deep learning? Exactly. So the source code for deep neural network are your data. So you need to go ahead and take a look at your data. And these are techniques for taking a look at our data. We want to go ahead and say a neural network for this particular image is focusing on this part of the image to make a decision. And that's the purpose of visualizing and trying to understand. Usually in deep neural networks with deep learning, you don't really care about your weights and biases. Unlike statistics, where you're gonna worry a lot about your weights and biases, put confidence bounds around them. Here you don't worry about them. You worry about your data. What is your model thinking? Yes, exactly. So there is a comment in the chat. So everything starts with the data and the ground truth could be wrong. The images could be confusing. There could be multiple classes in a single image. So that's the idea. That's why we are gonna go through visualization and deep understanding. Let's do it. This was an assignment for you to watch this YouTube video about visualizing and understanding. It is one of the first papers that were brave enough to try to open the black box of a neural network and see what they are thinking. So here for a couple of sessions, we are gonna try to open the black box as much as possible. Any questions about this? I have a question about the, the unpooling, basically the, the re-engineering process. Um, it is the intention of undo everything, basically utilizing the existing results of what has been computed, depending on like certain libraries. If all the weights during the um, computation are directly available, then we shouldn't have to do this, right? Uh, so what is the big picture here? There is an image that you're gonna take, for instance, this image, you're gonna take it, push it through your neural network architecture, and then you're gonna stop at some layer. That layer is gonna end up being a tensor. You cannot visualize all of that tensor. You're gonna try to visualize a slice. So it's gonna be one of your filter maps that you're gonna visualize. But now you want to visualize it on your original image. You want to come up with visualizations of your feature maps that look like this. How do you do it? First of all, it has to be conditioned on the image. So if you change the image, it has to change its focus. The visualiz visualization has to change. You take one of your feature maps because you want it to be conditioned on the input image, you're gonna keep storing. Whenever you have a pooling, you're gonna store where did you actually pull. And then the rest of it is going backward. Some of them are gonna be on pooling layers. Some of them are gonna be your regular activation. And some of them are gonna come out of your convolution. And F and F, F transpose are basically the same thing. These are the same numbers, just reshaped. So there is no training going on here. You're just taking a feature map, visualizing it. Does that answer your question? 
I think I get it. So it's to decompose what we did in the neural network and apply the 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 math on the left that's on the the image vectors or tensors, correct? Yeah. Yes, exactly. So okay. there is going to be some up resolution going on here. And to up resolve, you are going to look at your switches and then you are just going to do your unpooling. So this is your unpooling operation because whenever you have a convolution, uh, what's going to happen is that you're going to shrink the resolution from one layer to the next one. So your feature maps are going to have a lower resolution than the original image. So you have to do unpooling. It makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, sure. I have a question that um, on the deconvolve net layer, um, I took a look at the, the paper actually, and it, it seems like the general idea is to go to some ith layer and you wanna see how that is being represented compared to your original image. And so you choose a layer to stop at and you basically go through this deconvolve net process as many iterations as possible in order to get back to the original dimensions of the input image. Um, but uh, convolutions aren't created equal. So let's say you stop at layer five and you have done five convolutions. You might have done um, four three by three convolutions and they all had strides of two. And then the last one you had a seven by seven and you had a stride of one. So when you do this deconvolve net process, do you start from the just the previous convolution? So do you do a... Um, convolution with F transpose on the 11 by 11 or the seven by seven, and then go back to the three by threes that you did previously? Like, do you try to mirror everything that you did before? Yes, exactly. So everything is going to be the reverse of whatever steps that you took to go forward. So you can actually think of this as a back propagation. Uh, so whatever operation that you're doing here, it's derivative is going to appear here. So if you did a one by one convolution, then a three by three convolution, then one 11 by 11, then you're gonna first see the 11, 11, 11 by 11, then three by three, then one by one. So everything is gonna get reversed. And I guess for this architecture, uh, whenever you have a stride, you need to have these switches on. So you need to know you're taking this window and then uh, because you have to do the reverse route. Right, that makes sense. And then it was slightly unclear in the video. Um, the rectified linear function in the deconvolved net is identical or the reverse of the ReLU that's done in the original network? That's actually a very good point. And I'm going to cover two next papers trying to actually go through these linear activations and why you do them and how you do them exactly, mathematically. Sometimes it's hard from a figure to know what's going on. But what's happening is whatever that comes out of your unpooling, this unpooled map is going to go through a ReLU activation. And it's going to be maximum of these values and zero. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. So I guess I answered some of the questions on the chat also. Can you explain how max unpooling is done? Uh, yes, so you're going to just store, whenever you're pooling, you're going to store these switches locations, for instance, you're gonna store this location, this location, this other location, and the other location. Then from layer above, you have a lower resolution. You take those values, this is your lower resolution from layer above, you take those values, and then you just copy them wherever you had your switches. And then the rest of them, you're just gonna to set to zero. And then it's the duty or the responsibility of the next convolution to mix this information. So it's going to mix this information with the other zero values, and then it's going to give you non-zero values in the next layer after the convolution. Does that answer your question? So there is a comment in the chat. I thought visual visualizations like GradCam focus on how features for a specific class are extracted. Is that not more dependent on the weights than the data? Uh, not really. So it depends on both. It's going to depend on a combination of your weights and the data. But what you want to do, your network is making a mistake. For instance, classifying a dog as a cat. And then you want to know why. Why is it doing that? It's an anomaly. You want to know why. You're going to take your image, push it through your neural network, stop at multiple layers, 
you don't care what your weights are. You're just going to stop at the particular layer, look at the feature maps, and visualize. Where is your neural network looking? For instance, in this figure here, this is an anomaly. We know the true label is an Afghan hound, but your neural network is looking at the face of the woman. So now it's the idea of maybe go ahead and play around with your architecture, use another architecture, or maybe this image is confusing to begin with. It has three objects in it. Why should the correct label be the Afghan hound? Why shouldn't this be a woman or a man? Okay. So you are trying to look at your data. Data is the source code for deep learning. Perfect. Any other questions? And there is also a nice pattern here. The lower layers in your neural network, the ones closer to the input image, are going to learn generic features, such as there is an edge here. There is this color going on. So these are generic features. You can apply them to any image. But deeper into your neural network, these last layers, you are going to learn features that are specific to the class. For instance, you can see that at layer five, around here, you're actually focusing on the object of interest. They're going to start to have meaning. In the next paper, I'm going to go into more details, trying to build more intuition about this visualization process. So the next two papers are just about building more intuition and then some improvements. Yes, I guess uh, if there are no more questions from this one, I can continue.